Hi, welcome or welcome back. My name is Eleanor. This week, before I start talking about this week, I should explain. I'm a little bit annoyed. I feel annoyed right now. Why do I feel annoyed? I'm happy. I'm satisfied with my week. I think I'm annoyed because I have spent a lot of time with books that I've enjoyed. I've gained a lot. I've learned uh, so much. I don't regret one minute. And yet, they're not 100% my cup of tea. So let me so let me explain and let's go back. Let's go back a week because it's, yes, it's pretty much been seven days. So I, um, I start with a decision that I'm going to be reading more books that are on my shelves. So of course I immediately <laughs> go to my favorite bookstore and buy two books. Of course I do. <laughs> so I went to the literary criticism section first, just to see what was happening. And I see a little book, I see this. And I immediately have, you know, that tingly feeling you get when you, maybe you don't, but you probably do. If you're, if you are a lover of books, you get a feeling. There's a vibe from certain books. It's to do with the title, the author, the look of the book and the general sense that you're getting of it. I knew this was it. And how fascinating that I didn't actually realize that at first, that this was part of the same series of Princeton University Writers on Writing series, which I mentioned in uh, two videos back about Elizabeth Bishop. I have a little Elizabeth Bishop book written by Colin Tobin, and that's part of the same series, which I hadn't realized there was this one. So I got very excited for two different reasons. First of all, um, you know, if you've ever been into poetry, you, you know who Auden is, but that's all I knew. I didn't know, I, I don't think I, I hadn't been aware of reading him at all or knowing anything about him. I thought, oh, this is an excellent introduction. Just as Tobin helped me with learning about Elizabeth Bishop, this will be a personal introduction by Alexander McCall Smith, who I did know because he is a very, famous fiction writer. He's Scottish, but I believe he, he's lived in, in several different countries. In any case, he writes a series of books that are fun murder mysteries. Now, I'm a fan of murder mysteries, but I never really got into Alexander McCall Smith. That being said, how fascinating that he would write about his personal connection, his love for Auden, because this is what the Writers on Writers series does. So I thought, well, <laughs> I don't have any of Auden's poetry at home. And yeah, I wasn't going to wait for the library. So I went and bought this <laughs> because I thought, you know what? I thought, I thought this is going to be an excellent thing to have. It's, it's an excellent, and it is, it was an excellent decision to make. So these two together, can I say, if you have a poetry friend who you might think would be interested, these two together as a gift with a bar of chocolate. Just saying, it's a very nice gift. Okay, so I start to flip through Auden and it's a hell of a lot. It's a, he wrote a hell of a lot. And as far as I can tell, all of it is in um, in formal prosody. It's in meter. It's in rhyme. It's in specific uh, forms. So it and rhyme and and the rhyme makes it so readable. Um, everything is very smooth to read. But it's a lot. So I picked a few small ones. And I read them and I, uh, as I do, I called a friend and I said, what do you think about this one? It's called the more loving one. And 
I read it and I thought, well, that's really silly and simplistic and didactic. And then I thought, no, it's not. It's actually really surprising. And I don't think it means what I think it means. <laughs> so, you know, call a friend, which I highly recommend. And, uh, and the friend reads it and we have a really good discussion and we go back and forth about it. And I think to myself, aha, I think I'm getting an idea of what Auden is doing. He is writing poems that are easy to read, more or less, and seem to make sense. But on second reading, deeper reading, you realize that you, you read it too fast and he might not be saying what you think he's saying. And that's, that's very exciting for me. But in the back of my mind, I thought, what would I know? I've just started reading Auden and I'm just having one discussion with a friend. So I go to this and I read this. And the more I read it, the more I realize that I can be confident in the way I'm starting to see Auden. I don't have to put myself down just because I've never read Auden before. And I don't need to do a huge amount of research. I need an introduction from someone just to give me a bit of encouragement and confidence in my own opinion. And so this is why the Writers on Writers series is so good because what Alexander McCall Smith, God bless him, is saying here is basically, this is how I discovered Auden. It was in, it was in my 20s, he says. And I read his early works and I, and I liked them and I related to them. And then as I grew older, I read further. And these are the reasons I like Auden. And this is the story of my life as it pertains to my connection to a poet who lived, you know, who wrote mostly in the 1930s. And uh, that's a very refreshing way to enter the world of a poet, especially when he's, um, you know, he's taught at universities and you might think to yourself, as I did, what would I know? Um, also, very interestingly, Alexander McCall Smith, and let me check that I'm getting my name right. He, he tells, he, he has an anecdote in this book about Auden's literary executor, who is a professor called Edward Mendelssohn. Edward Mendelssohn contacts Alexander McCall Smith. Why does he do that? Because, and I'll just say McCall Smith now, because McCall Smith wrote a series, I, I don't know if he's even still writing it, um, called well, the first book in the series is called The Sunday Philosophy Club, which I immediately got out of my library and which my library still had, even though it was first published in 2004. So that shows you how popular this is. And this series stars a, uh, an amateur detective uh, called Isabel de Lucy. And Isabel de Lucy is a huge Auden fan. Of course she is, because the author who created her is an Auden fan. So what he does, and and this, I, I actually just finished this. And this is why, and this book is why I'm both excited and annoyed. <laughs> why, what happened was, McCall Smith has Isabel de Lucy, his fictional character, quote from Auden occasionally when she's trying to solve a crime. And Edward Mendelssohn, this literary executor of Auden, writes to Alexander McCall Smith to say to him, I love the way you incorporated Auden into your series of books. And I believe that Auden would agree with you that you've done the right thing. So already I'm so excited and so intrigued, as I imagine you are too, because this is this is just something that doesn't usually happen. You know, when you read a poet who's, you know, you don't have, as I'm saying, you don't have to be in university for this stuff. So then, so apparently in, and there's so many other books in this Isabel de Lucy series, later on, 
McCall Smith and Professor Mendelssohn become friends and one day McCall Smith, uh, Smith asks him if he would mind being put into one of his Isabel de Lucy books as a character. So the real Edward Mendelssohn placed into the fictional world of Isabel de Lucy, just as the real Auden's poetry is placed in. And Professor Mendelssohn says, yes, I would love to. And that is... And, and so this was done. So that's why I wanted to start reading this series because it's fantastic. Apparently, there's a fictional literary festival in one of the books and there's Professor Mendelssohn and Isabel gets, you know, is very excited because she loves Auden and he's someone who she can pick his brains about Auden. Then it's also doubly interesting because Auden, from, from a few poems as you start reading him you realize that he is i hesitate to say didactic because you don't because he he hides it well but he you do feel that with most of his poems he has a conviction he has a strong idea he has a a theme in mind that he wants to teach the reader about it's something for example with elizabeth bishop there's none of that. With Auden, there's a lot of that. But, I mean, he's such an amazing writer just because of the meter and the rhyme and the vocabulary he uses that you kind of go along with it. Like, go on, teach me something. And also, he seems to be, he seems to be a poet who is open to changing his mind as well. So, in any case... At some point in this book, Mendelssohn is quoted as saying, we feel we understand Auden's work even when we don't. And I think that that is the biggest takeaway for me from this book, among a lot of very, very wonderful anecdotes and bits and pieces. So I would say if you enjoy serious poetry that's going to follow the rules of meter and rhyme that were set in a previous generation of poets. And if you're interested in a certain type of clarity, that's not, it's not reductive, but it is, you are able to talk about a point the poet is making if that is of interest to you give Auden a go he's amazing now that being said let's say you this is what I've been thinking this morning over coffee let's say you're interested in making a point or you want to explore a theme specifically clearly then you choose poetry as your medium you, you don't choose an essay form, you don't use, choose fiction, you, you choose poetry. And then on top of that, you choose for all your poems a very strict, very difficult form to set that idea into. So you make a rule for yourself. It feels like it makes sense. It might sometimes make sense to a reader, but really... But really, it's random. So you say to yourself, let's say you start to write the poem. And you think, oh, I like the sound of this. So it's got five beats. And uh, a lot of poems are written in five beats. So that's what I'll do. And I'd like the rhyme to be alternating. You're already going to have to sacrifice some of your point. Because you have to make it fit the form. This is why it's so interesting to me that Auden never, as far as I can tell, gave up that strict formality in his writing. Because let's say you have your first edit of a poem. You might see that you didn't really write what you meant to write because you had to rhyme this word with that word. Or this word had too many syllables for that line, so you had to put it on another line. So you you have to make... <laughs> you. 
you have to make concessions to this random form because to you it's become part of the art as it should be because that was your decision as an artist and you don't have to rationalize it um i've i've had teachers who and, and this is a trend now i think i mean what would i know but the couple of classes a couple of workshops i took had a trend in them <laughs> i'm gonna stick to it the trend is that you choose a form that fits your subject matter well so i would never choose an alternating rhyme scheme because how am i going to rationalize that i'm going to say oh you know i'm writing about a and therefore it matches an alternate line rhyming scheme. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It seems silly to me. I think what's happening with what ideally should happen with poets, like in my paradise of poets, I imagine this is how poets work, is that they allow themselves the freedom that other artists have to choose the kind of form they want to write in and they don't have to explain it. They don't have to justify it to anyone. So, you know, if a, a great artist picks up watercolors and decides that they just want to paint with watercolors, a critic doesn't have the right to say, explain rationally to me why you chose watercolors rather than oil paints. It's because I wanted to, because I'm an artist. I'm not a scientist. This isn't an experiment. Okay, I'm getting off my high horse now, <laughs> off the soapbox, back to autumn. So I am a real geek when it comes to prosody. I absolutely love prosody. So again, if you love the art, the, if you love the craft, if you like counting syllables, if you like to test yourself on where the accents go, if you like to spot the full rhymes and, uh, and uh, rhymes that are not perfect, etc. Auden, Auden is the one for you. There's a lot, a lot to teach you. You'll never actually come to the end because there's so much to learn. If you're interested in... Why do I never have the book I need? Hang on. If you're interested in prosody, I would recommend this book by Timothy Steele. Actually, I'll leave a link to his website, Timothy Steele, All the Funds in How You Say a Thing, an Explanation of Meter and Versification. Um, he's just come out with a new edition of it, I believe, which is very exciting because I had to buy this as a used book from some library many years ago. This is the book you need if you want to geek out on that sort of thing. So, what was I saying? So, this is now I'm justifying what I always thought because while reading this, I realize that I'm not the only one who is thinking about these things in this way. Um, and when I did a little bit more research into some of the criticism, into some of the writings about Auden, critics do mention that there is a possibility in some of his forms you, that, there's a, that there's a sense that the reader gets that perhaps some of his meaning is sacrificed to the form and also maybe some of the truth and I think he also spoke about that like he is he was a poet who was adamant that he would only write poems that were true to him and because he wrote political poems that meant that sometimes he wanted to you know to destroy them after they were published because he didn't feel that they actually said the truth of what he feels and thinks. And that was, that's, that's really makes me love him even more. 
but there is a sense that you have to sacrifice some of your truth if you're going to fit into this particular uh, metrical scheme. Now, part of why I'm annoyed is that this is a really boring book. Love a good mystery, murder mystery, but this is deadly dull. I love the protagonist. I love Isabel de Lucy. I love her. And I mark the bits where she quotes Auden, and I love those too. But I am, I am still very interested in reading the next few in the series just to follow her ideas of Auden and to see where Professor Mendelssohn shows up. Now moving on, one of the so one of the poems that she mentions. And I'll quote, this is from page 119 of, of the murder mystery. She's thinking of someone that she's discovered is unfaithful. And she says, in such a way and with such a heart must people creep away from brothels or the locus of an illicit assignation. Assignation. Assignation? Mortal guilty, as WHA would have it. <laughs> she, she just puts WHA for Auden. In that grave poem in which he describes the aftermath of the carnal, when sleeping heads might lie so innocently upon faithless arms. And so, um, you know, I, look, I, I, I knew because I had been trying to read that one that she was talking about lullaby, which is on page 107 of this. And so now I'm going back to that poem with this murder mystery in mind and my whole framework has shifted. So now I'm really enjoying the, the intellectual puzzle of it. I'm going back to reread a poem and question what I thought about it. And it's taking it away from an academic setting, which I really like. And I'll be linking to this poem, Lullaby, because I think it's a really good one if you want to get a sense of Auden. Now, you probably have heard Auden's poetry. If nowhere else, then... Um, a poem that some people call the funeral blues which was read in the movie for weddings and a funeral i will link i will link to that one as well i bet if i read it out loud you would know it Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. Um, if you know that, then you know Auden. But I would say that um, I would point you to Lullaby if you want to really get into the meat and guts of what he is about. I'll link to Lullaby, and then I'm also going to link to a poem. So in this in this poem, the Lullaby, so why this fictional character, Isabel de Lucy, brings it up is that it, this is a complicated poem about how, yes, not every lover is faithful, and things don't work out as you always wish and you can't control your feelings in love relationships but also we're all human and there's a kind of unconditional love that comes with that i'm paraphrasing very very badly but in this poem there's a section where two lovers are mentioned and then this unusual bit which i like the best in the poem 
while an abstract insight wakes among the glaciers and the rocks, the hermit's carnal ecstasy. So the poet is talking about a couple who is in the in that passionate time of reciprocated love, but there's also this hermit and the carnal ecstasy of a hermit amongst the rocks. And that reminded me of an Elizabeth Bishop poem. So I'm going to link to that as well, because this might be a way from, well, I don't know if this is a way for you, whoever you are, to see if you like who you like more, Auden or Bishop, although you don't have to choose. But maybe it's a way of me coming to terms with why I prefer Bishop to Auden, and why I'm a little bit annoyed that I've spent so much time on Auden, even though I've loved it. Because I never have that annoyance when I spend time with Bishop. And I'm going to link to her poem, Chemin de Fer, about a railroad track. And at the very end, it start, and again, she's using... I mean, she's counting beats. It's it's not a. There's no pattern, but uh, there is a rhyme scheme, and and so it's interesting to compare her to Auden as well because they both love rhyme. So her poem starts off alone on the railroad track. I walked with pounding heart. The ties were too close together, or maybe too far apart. Uh, see, I definitely see. Very personal thing, poetry. I really prefer Bishop to Auden. Um, anyway, um, the, the poem continues to talk about a an old hermit. So when I read in Auden's lullaby, The Hermit's Carnal Ecstasy, I immediately thought of this poem by Bishop um, so she's walking along the railroad track in her poem. Again, I'm paraphrasing badly, but whatever. It's my channel. I can do what I want, <laughs> I guess. Um, and she comes across this area where the old, where, where the dirty hermit lives. And she, she writes, the hermit, <clears throat> the hermit shot off his shotgun and the tree by his cabin shook. Over the pond went a ripple. The pet hen went chook chook. Love should be put into action, screamed the old hermit. Across the pond, an echo tried and tried to confirm it. <laughs> I really love that. Now, it's not really fair, now that I'm thinking about it, it's not really fair to compare this to the Auden poem. I mean, for many different reasons, why should we compare and contrast? Every, every poet is different. But it's also doubly unfair because, in fact, this lullaby is one of the few poems, from what I can tell, not that I'm a scholar, not that, not that I'm an Auden scholar after reading him for five days, on and off, in between my other life. But um, he doesn't really, uh, he, he doesn't have regular meter and rhyme in this poem. And and that's interesting too for many different reasons. It uh, it's very effective. In any way, maybe something that I've said will make sense with you. But another thing that Auden did was bring me to Christopher Isherwood. And this is where it's really quite funny because, oh yes, because I started this week by wanting to read something that was on my shelves. And I ended up buying two books. I bought these two books from my bookstore and I got this out of the library. Still not reading the books on my shelf. But then when I read about Auden and who were his friends and what his life was like, because he's a very interesting man himself, and I recommend looking him up, intriguing, his best friend was Christopher Isherwood. And this is a name I knew because I'd come across it in my shelves. Um... 
I thought, oh, this is interesting. Goodbye to Berlin. So the shells are my grandpa's. My my um my grandpa, I gave me his. I I inherited my grandpa's library basically, and my goal in life is to read as much as I can from it. <laughs> Not working out very well, but. Christopher Isherwood, this is the book I have. These are excellent illustrations on the cover. Aren't they wonderful? And I didn't know. Is that fantastic? The artist is George Gross. The sketches inside as well. Germany in the 30s goodbye to Berlin so I started reading it and I couldn't stop I had no idea who Christopher show who Christopher Isherwood was and what a wonderful writer he was goodbye to Berlin is a series of his short he calls he he presented his diary entries from the 1930s i think they were actually published in 1939 but his he dates his diary entries although it's you know it's somewhat fictionalized starting with 1930 and finishing in 1933 just as hitler uh, came on the scene and if you are familiar, as you probably are, with the musical Cabaret, that is based, but loosely, on these, on these, I don't know what to call them, short stories, novellas. He writes in a particularly clear and rhythmic way that's very, very easy to read so you're reading quickly and easily and part of the revelation of reading this and of course i came to read it without really knowing very much about it part of the revelation is that it's like watching in real time how a society succumbs to evil on a grand scale and it happens very very slowly and you hardly hardly notice it and as a reader of this that's exactly what happened to me now issue and Auden were friends from school from boarding school from when they were young um they were both gay and uh, but they were they were i mean they might have been lovers at some point but they were friends and it's very interesting to read Goodbye to Berlin in that respect as well, because they both traveled to Germany because it was safer to be openly gay in Germany in the early 90s, late 20s, early 30s than it was, let's say, in, in um, England. Yeah. So I do highly recommend Goodbye to Berlin, and I'm so pleased I read it. It, uh, it. The distressing aspects creep up on you very subtly, and you almost don't know how that could be, but they do. And then I realized I looked into issue a bit more and I realized that he wrote a single man which is you know the film with Colin Firth which I didn't know either so really two immense writers who also were and I suppose still are gay literary role models um, so there you have it that's my week so i suppose now that i'm recounting it on camera i admit i'm not really annoyed 
I'm actually really thankful. And I also feel like because I kept making an effort and I kept trying to go deeper in my reading and in my understanding, I've learned so much. <laughs> it's been an amazing week. And even though I am doing this for myself, and these videos are a way of me keeping myself accountable to my reading and thinking and creative life. I do thank you for being here because that is part of it. <laughs> And uh, I'll see you next week. Who knows what next week will bring. <laughs> no. Okay. And don't forget, the only real property is the property of the mind. Ciao.